So uh, we're going to uh, we're going to get into this lesson this morning on God's deliverance, and I want to begin with uh, with this. And I, and some of you may remember this, some of you may not, but it is uh, a speech that George uh, President George W. Bush delivered on uh, the USS Abraham Lincoln on the first of May, two thousand and three. The coalition forces had just finished the Battle of Iraq. And Lincoln had just itself, the ship had finished a 10-month tour and it was headed home. And so Bush arrived to, to wish them well and to get up and give this speech. And thanks to our lovely media and our love for President Bush and, and how everyone just, just thought he was the great and awesomest president ever, everyone ignored his speech and just looked at the sign in the back. Right? That's all they focused on was a sign on the back that said, mission accomplished. And, and they, they completely ignored everything that he said in his speech and just focused on that banner and to say, yeah, well, obviously mission is not accomplished. We've got so much left to do and Bush has got that wrong. And, and they must have, got, must have kind of come together and decided what word to use. And, and the word that they all decided to use was hubris. Hubris is a wonderful word. It means excessive arrogance. And you might think arrogance is bad enough, but then you've got hubris, and that's even worse than, than just plain old arrogance. It's this idea that you can kind of just shake your fish, a uh, fish, your fist. That's a, that would also be hubris, by the way. Uh, they're, they're equally hubristic. I'm not quite sure. But you could uh, shake your fist in, the, in, the, in the, the sight of the gods or God or whatever else, and declare victory. Look at us, and we've done so well, and nothing bad can possibly happen to us, and it's all downhill from here, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll see about that. That's hubris, right? So they were accusing him of hubris, and so the question is, in, in our own spiritual lives, is when can we say mission accomplished? We don't want to be, is that even a word, hubristic? I'm, let's just say it is. We don't want to be guilty of hubris. We don't want that. But is there a point that we can say mission accomplished? Now think of uh, Ephesians chapter 6, 12 through 13. This battle that we're in, talk about the battles that, that Bush was talking about. Ephesians 6, 12 through 13. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, to stand firm. That's a victory condition. To stand firm. This is what you need to do. So here's the idea, kind of the imagery that we get from this passage that you're out on the battlefield and, 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 and you're been fighting and, and you've been using the whole armor of God and you've been wailing away and it's been tough and, and you're bloodied and you're wounded and, and yet there you are standing and you're looking out over the battlefield and all you see is, apart from yourself, is, is your brothers and sisters in Christ. You see Christ, you see God, you see the Holy Spirit, right? That's all. All that is left, all the enemies are down on the ground and you are standing, right? That's victory. That's a victory condition. When can we say that we have met that victory condition? Think about 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life. That's a victory condition. To which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So when can we declare that we have met those conditions. So think about our mission objectives. What, are we, what have we got out there? And I want to focus this morning on a passage, and we'll, we'll come back to it in just a minute, but I'll focus on Joshua 13. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a run-up to what's going on there, of course Joshua has taken over from Moses, and uh, the Israelites now have arrived on the eastern bank of the Jordan River, and they're about to cross over. They're ready to conquer the rest of the promised land. But there is an outstanding issue because there's two and a half tribes who have arrived at their location, right? Mission accomplished for them. They've arrived. This was their location for Gad and uh, for Reuben and for the half tribe of Manasseh. They've arrived. This is their land. 
that they were allotted, this is the promised land for them, right? Not all the promised land is, on, is uh, to the west of the Jordan River. Some of it was to the east of the Jordan River. So they've arrived. And it might have been, and in fact it was, very tempting for these people to say, well, we're here, we've done everything that we've been asked to do, and uh, let's start planting our vineyards, and let's start planting our olive trees, and plowing the ground, and building our houses, and just get settled down and put down our roots. But they have to be reminded that that is not the condition. The deal was not, you get your piece of land and leave all the other brother tribes to go off and try to get the job done. You're in this together. So let's go back to that condition that was specified to Moses in Numbers chapter 32, beginning at verse 20. So Moses said to them, if you will do this, if you will take up arms to go before the Lord for the war, and every armed man of you will pass over the Jordan, in other words, go over from, from the east to the west, before the Lord, until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then after that you shall return and be free of obligation to the Lord and to Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. So there's the victory conditions. Once all the other tribes have possessed their land, then your military forces, your armed forces can then go back to the eastern side of the Jordan and take up your land. And here it is, repeated again in Joshua chapter 1, 14 and 15. Your wives, and he's talking here specifically to these two and a half tribes. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. Talking about the eastern side of the Jordan. Right, so they can stay there. But all the men of valor, the soldiers among you, shall pass over armed before your brothers, and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession on the other side of the Jordan, and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. All right, so that's on the east there. So that's what you can do. And, and until you do that, then uh, you've, you've got to hang, hang out with the rest of us here. And they agree to that. All right, so everything turns out well, fine. And they go, yeah, thank you for reminding us about that, Joshua. And, uh, and, and we're, we're going to st stick with you and let our families stay behind while we go off and fight this war. And so, so this is the conditions that God has set before them. They've got to go off to the rest of the promised land, and then they can come back. Now, here's a question, the same question that was asked of Bush back on uh, after he gave that speech. Was it mission accomplished? Did they get to where they needed to go? Go to uh, Joshua chapter 13. Turn with me, if you would. I just want to read the first uh, seven verses of Joshua 13. Now, Joshua was old. And advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, as if he didn't already know, you're old. All right, thank you, God. And advanced in years, and there remains yet very much land to possess. Very much land to possess. Mm. This is the land that yet remains. All the regions of the Philistines and all those of the Geshurites, from the Shehor, which is east of Egypt, northward, uh, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza and Ashdod and Ashkelon and Gath and Ekron and those of the Avim in the south of all the land of the Canaanites and the Mirah that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites and the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon toward the sunrise from Baal Gad below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Misrephoth Maim, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out before the people of Israel." Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now, therefore, divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. All right. So that's the condition on the ground. That's where we're at with this military campaign, with this conquest as we see it right here. That God has very clearly told them there's much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains. And here's this big long list of the land that yet remains. But look at verse 6. I myself, God speaking here, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. And so in effect, what he's doing is he's saying, look, you've done as much as you can do. You know, you've, you've met the conditions that I've set for you in the sense that you tried, right? But there's only so much you can do. 
It's only, you know, the idea that there would be absolute victory, that there would not be a single plot of land, a single square inch of land that would be left in the hands of the Canaanites and these other people that they've mentioned, the idea that you could take every single bit and possess that, that's probably beyond you. But you had, you had a try at it. I appreciate that, God is saying. But you know what? I'm going to do the rest for it. I'm going to do the rest of it. I'm going to finish this for you. Look at a, a map, if you would, of just take a, any old map of uh, the allotments of, uh, of uh, the tribal lands for, for the Israelites, and you'll notice on the right-hand side of, uh, of the Jordan, on the eastern side of the, the Jordan River, you see the allotments for Reuben, and then north of that is Gad, and then north of that is, is Manasseh. And then go over to the east there. Notice Judah. Judah is kind of where we expect it in the south there, and then there's a little, a little allotment there for the tribe of Benjamin, and right between Benjamin and Judah, almost right there on the border, is Jerusalem. Now, this map that I've got here on the screen is actually a little bit misleading because it's showing you some of the names that we're more familiar with from later on. Jerusalem is not Jerusalem at this time. Jerusalem is not Jerusalem at the time that we're reading from Joshua chapter 13. It is, in fact, Jebus. It is in the control of the Jebusites and they're part of the Canaanite people, and they've still got the land. In fact, it is going to take 400 years before Jebus is finally taken with God's help by David and his people, and then he makes it his capital, and it becomes the city of David. It becomes Jerusalem at that point. It's going to take 400 years, and God's going to help them do that, but it's going to take time before the job is finally done, done and God is going to help them do that. So the Israelites kind of sort of had Jebus until God helped them out. So what's the lesson for us? What's the, the Christian mission here? And we could scan our way through the New Testament and find lots of places with, of all the kinds of things that we're supposed to do. But let me just at least check off just a, a few things here. Think about the Great Commission. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations. Have you done that? You done yet? You finished that? What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, we, we're not finished yet, are we? Uh, maybe we've taken it to a lot of nations, but are we finished with that yet? Have we taken and made disciples of all the nations? Do we have disciples in as much as we can in Mongolia or in you know, Bhutan or you know, wherever it is, right? Have we made disciples of all the nations? Think about faith. Are you done with your faith yet? Are you finished? Are you where you want to be? He's like, I've got nothing more to do. <laughs> I'm done with my faith. Why am I here? You know, and again, good question, right? So what are we doing? Are we finished with our faith? Parenting. Think about that. Ephesians 6, 4. Bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. For those of you parents who are in the, the audience this morning, are you finished with that? You can, have you written that off? You just check that off. I've done that. Here's the thing. We do have a mission but we may never finish the mission in our own lifetimes. And think about the Great Commission. It, it continues until Jesus comes. As long as there is somebody left on the earth who is not a disciple, that mission continues. We know it's going to be their choice. We can't force them to do that. We can't always get everywhere we want to get. It's going to be difficult. But that's kind of like the mission that they faced there in the time of Joshua. It's going to be tough. And we're not going to be able to get to every single spot. We're not going to be able to get to every individual. But we're going to give it a good try, right? Because that's what God wants us to do. What about faith? You think about Paul writing in Philippians 3 and 12 through 14. He says, not that I am already perfect. And he hasn't got there yet. And I believe here by perfection he has in mind ultimately his eternal reward in heaven. In that sense of being made perfect. He says, I'm not already perfect. That hasn't happened yet. So it's, it's yet still something to be done for Paul. And then think about parenting, and there's a sense in which we never stop being parents. We, we're always going to have that relationship with our children. We're always going to be parents, but when do we say, well, our job, according to Ephesians 6, is done? When do we say that? When do we declare victory? 
Is it when we're uh, teaching Bible to our little kids? Is it, is it when they're baptized? Is it when they're baptized and they're now living their lives and, and doing and just independently? Well, we don't even have to get them out of bed on Sunday morning. They're just going to get up and come to worship. Or if we send them off to, to university, they're just going to, they're going to go to find the nearest uh, Lord's uh, church to go worship with and, and they don't even have to be nagged or reminded to do that. They're going to do that. Oh, that's pretty good. And then maybe they meet a, a, a wonderful Christian man or woman. They... They get married, and that's great. And I, I remember uh, there's a, a man that, that probably none of you have heard of, but a wonderful man, Donnie Hilliard, who was a professor of Bible at, uh, at Faulkner University. And he ran uh, for, for several years there the Cloverdale Center for Family Strengths. And his PhD at the University of Alabama and other research that he had done with other people was all focused on what does it take to build a strong family. We hear so many negative things about the family and how the family's going wrong and all the divorce rate and all the rest of it. But what are we doing right? You know, all these families, they're doing something right. And so he's really interested in doing that. And he, he, he told us once, he said, he said, my wife and I will declare victory when our children meet and marry Christian wives or Christian spouses and they're raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In other words, when... When we've fulfilled Ephesians 6.4 is when they start doing Ephesians 6.4. That's when we think we can declare mission accomplished, of course, but like we never, in the sense, we never finish being parents. We've got that challenge ahead of us, but the Lord will finish for us. He will help us get to where we want to go. Think about 2 Peter chapter 1. 10 to 11, he's listed all these different things, all these uh, add to your virtue, knowledge, and love, and so on. He gets to all these different things, and he says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. That's a mission objective, right? That's a victory goal that we want to aim for. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? You do this. You make your calling an election. Sure, you confirm that. And you know what? I'll open that door for you. I'll open that door to eternal life for you. I will finish that part of it for you. And so ultimately what we're looking for is what the subject, the topic of today's lesson is this deliverance, to be delivered from Whatever we can do from this tough life that we're in, from the hardships that we face, from the ups and downs of life, knowing that we just can't do everything on our own, but knowing that in the end, God will deliver us. And again, I think about going, going back to, to Moses and going back to the, the issue of uh, the conquest and, and the exodus and all the rest of it. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I... Even I am He. And this is Moses singing this song here. And he, he's just handing over the reins to Joshua. And he's singing the song of the Lord. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And so you get to that point where you've got these Israelites who are taking over uh, this part of the land. They're doing their best and they're not getting it 100%. They're not finished but God says, well, you do what you need to do. You be faithful in the covenant of the Lord, and I will finish this for you. And, and there is none, when I do that, there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Very similar sentiment in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, when Paul says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We will be delivered. And God will make sure that that is the case. He will finish that for us. And nobody can take it away from us because that is in God's hands. I just want to finish just a minute here and go back to this mission accomplished thing, just for completeness, to just kind of make it all come full circle here. I actually went back and read a transcript of the speech that, uh, and look, I'm not a big Bush fan. I, you know, I don't really care too much about the guy. Um, but I think it's interesting to go back and uh, to, to read the transcript of the speech that he delivered on uh, the deck of the, the USS Abraham Lincoln that day. It's interesting that 
he never ordered for this banner to be put up there. That was something done by, by other people. It wasn't his idea to have this banner put up there. He never, in his speech, said, yeah, we're done. We can go home. The job, the job is finished. In fact, specifically, he said, our mission continues. He said, this will take time. He said, the war is not over. And just to put the, kind of the, the, the cherry on, on, on the top of it, he actually quoted a passage from the book of Isaiah. How about that? When was the last time you heard a politician quoting from the scripture last time? But he's putting that in that context, that realization that really so much is in God's hands. And ultimately, God is the only one who can finish it. And God will deliver us. And when he does that, there is where the certainty lies. And we have all these doubts about our lives. And we have all these doubts about our own abilities and our own capacity as, as, uh, as broken human beings to get the job done. And it seems like we get setbacks and we go two steps forward and one step back. And, and will it ever end? And maybe there's no point. And why don't we just go home? You know, just we're, we've arrived at this point, just settle right where we are. And God says, no, I keep on going and I will deliver you. Thank you.